Good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, 12 15, and uh, my name is Bob Ax Shamsi. I'm an attorney here with Beresford Booth, and you have uh, signed in to uh, one of our webinars that we put on from time to time. And uh, today's webinar is on contractor liens. I hope you're all excited for, for this. Um, specifically, I'm going to be talking about RCW 60.04 uh, on mechanics and material men's liens, which I'm going to just refer to as contractor liens for simplicity's sake. Uh, we're going to go through some of the provisions and some important things to consider when reviewing the statute and, and understanding the law in this, in this particular area. Um, but it's, of course, by no means an exhaustive uh, overview of, of all the fine details of this, of this extremely exciting and, uh, area. So to the extent that any of you have questions or, or that you want to ask, you're welcome to put those questions into the chat. Uh, if I'm able to reach those questions afterwards, I'll most certainly do so. But if not, you're also welcome to email me or give me a phone call at any time. My contact information is going to be on the last slide uh, when we get there. And so I'll certainly highlight that for you. Uh, it's past 12.15, so I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, so this is an introduction to contractor liens. I'm Bob Akshamsi. I do uh, business and real estate litigation here at the firm. Uh, and I have personally litigated a number of these kinds of uh, claims on behalf of uh, contractors and subcontractors over the years. And uh, I think we can go ahead and get started. So who can record a contractor lien? I think that's uh, the essential question. Uh, and under RCW 604021, it has the, the lien authorized section, if you will, that says any person furnishing labor, professional services, materials, or equipment for the improvement of real property shall have a lien upon improvement for the contract price of labor, professional services, materials, or equipment furnished at the instance of the owner or the agent or construction agent of the owner. So this would apply to general contractors and subcontractors and uh, in, uh, suppliers, people who are providing labor or professional services. Uh, sometimes it'll be individuals or, or companies that are just providing labor. Sometimes they'll be providing just material and sometimes they'll be providing both. Uh, and so this is the statute that, that a lot of these contractor companies and, and subcontractor companies will fall under. And so knowing the nuts and bolts of what's going on, what you can do, can't do, uh, and, and especially one of the most important things I'm gonna highlight is timing. Timing with this statute and timing with these liens is absolutely everything uh, when it comes to wanting to retain your lien rights in the event that uh, you want to foreclose on a property if, if uh, payment is not made or just preserve your, your lien rights for a certain period of time so that you can get paid uh, down the road if it takes longer for, uh, say, your general contractor to pay you or the owner to pay you, depending on, on what your circumstances are. So uh, we can go ahead and, and move on to the next section. So um, one of the most important things to consider is, is before... Uh, you even lien a property and and get to work and, and all of that, there's the pre-claim notice to an owner. Uh, and most contractors have to provide a pre-claim notice to owners under RCW 604-031. Um, this pre-lien notice to owner uh, can be mailed by certified or registered mail to the owner or personally served upon the owner. Um, and there, there are a number of different exceptions to this, but this is the general rule and, and the consequences for failing to do so can be uh, pre pretty bad, quite frankly. Um, and so the, the exceptions are people who contract directly with the owner or the owner's common law agent. So the, the thinking behind that, of course, is the owner knows what's going on. You've contracted with them directly. They've, they've signed the contract and so they know what your services are going to be and, and and all of that and so there isn't that same concern that you might have if you're you know entering into the contract with the general to provide these services that the owner may be just contracting directly with the general uh laborers whose claims of lien are based solely on performing labor exclusively uh or subcontractors who contract for the uh improvement of real property directly with the prime contractor 
except where there's certain circumstances involving existing owner occupied single family residences or pertinent garages. So there's a there's a carve out there, but generally these three categories are the categories where a claim shall not be or a notice of claim is not required. Um, otherwise, it is required. And uh, if you the notice to owner also only relates back to work performed 60 days from the date it was delivered to the owner. So timely delivery is very important. Um, although there's an exception for new construction of a single family residence where it's only back 10 days. So making sure that you issue the uh, pre lien notice to owner is, is very important. If you don't fall under one of those exceptions, you know, if you didn't contract directly, if you're not providing uh, uh, labor only, or if um, you don't fall under the, the subcontractors who have these uh, exceptions where they they uh, contract with the general contractor, but um, you know it, it, it involves these these kind of sub exceptions that are at issue. So making sure to get that done is extremely important. Um, best practice is to serve the pre lien notice personally uh, and get a signed copy so that you have proof that the owner has received it signed it, signed off on it, and you can show that down the road saying, no, we definitely have this done. Not only have we had this done, we have the owner sign off on it, and um, you know, we're, we're essentially good to go. So uh, that would be you know, the general recommendation to, to, to do that. The consequences, uh, a lien authorized by the chapter is not going to be enforced unless the lien claimant is complied with these provisions. So the uh, you know, consequences are pretty serious. So Definitely need to pay attention to those uh, categories and whether you fall under the exceptions. And, and if you don't, better make sure that, to get that notice out the door. Uh, there are also other notices. The statute has several. Uh, there's the pre-claim notice to customers. So this is for uh, general contractors who may have to provide a notice to customers under RCW 18.27.114, a different statute. So again, these issues can get complicated. They, they cross-reference with other statutes. And uh, you know, depending on what you're doing and, and the size of your project, you may have different requirements that you have to navigate through uh, to ensure that your lien is effective. So uh, the pre-claim notice to customer, it applies uh, in, in a couple of different circumstances. One would be when you're working on four or fewer residential units or accessory structures on such residential property when the bid or contract price totals $1,000 or more. So that's four or fewer residential units or accessory structures uh, when it's $1,000 or more. Or if it's commercial property, it's when the contract price is between $1,000 and $60,000. So there's kind of a range there of um, contract price points where you need to issue this notice to the customer. And if you fall in one of those two categories and you have to issue the notice, you better keep a copy of it because you have to be able to produce a signed copy of this document for three years, whether it be electronic or hard copy from the date it's signed. Um, so get it signed and keep it for at least three years so that you're you know, not caught uh, in a difficult situation. Um, if you don't do this, if your general contractor falls in one of these categories and you fail to provide this notice to the customer and can't show a signed copy of this document, it says that uh, you cannot record a lien without alleging and proving that you gave this notice to the customer. Uh, and so, again, these notices are extremely important because if you fail to provide them and you're in a category of, of, of uh, contractors that has to provide them, the consequences are you can't enforce your lien right. So these are pretty fundamental issues to navigate through. Um, beyond that, violation uh, of this statute has a couple of different consequences. One is considered an infraction with a monetary penalty of between $200 and $5,000. It's also an automatic violation of the Consumer Protection Act. Uh, and that can be a steep issue. That can lead up to up to $25,000 in punitive damages and a recovery of attorney's fees and costs. So if you end up in litigation with uh, a customer over your failure to provide this notice and they can show that you didn't provide it, uh, they can get their attorney's fees and costs in litigation for, for having to do that. So uh, definitely the consequences can stagger up. And uh, so being on top of this from the outset is really important. Um, you know, it's a bit of extra work going in, but 
it's definitely worth it. And you want to follow the statutory procedures and make sure you, you know what you're doing before you, you know, end up down the road figuring out that you forgot to give a notice and you've completed all this work and now you're, you're in big trouble. Um, there's also some L&I materials that have to be provided. I'm not going to be going into that in any detail, but they're, they're covered in a couple of statutes, um, subsection 250 and 255 and RCW 60.04. But these, uh, this L&I generated information also needs to be provided uh, by contractors when providing the notice to customers. So they kind of go hand in hand. Uh, so you got to just make sure that all the necessary forms are provided. You know, this kind of thing comes up in a lot of different areas of law. For example, landlords who rent to, to residential tenants have to give a series of, of different documents to the tenants, you know, especially in the city of Seattle. There's there's all kinds of additional requirements for that. Similarly, with, with this statute, there's going to be requirements of making sure you give the notices and the, the generated forms to uh, your uh, potential customers so that you don't, you know, fall afoul of the statute and find yourself in hot water down the road. So. Uh, and then one more notice. So again, these, these things keep cropping up uh, repeatedly um, throughout the statute. Uh, this is a, a, a general notice of construction at the construction job site uh, for, again, general contractors for any construction project in excess of $5,000. And there's a series of different things that need to be um, put into the notice for it to essentially be effective and uh, complete. So uh, for those that's covered under RCW 604230, uh, you need the legal description, uh, you need the, uh, or the, the tax parcel number that's been assigned pursuant to uh, RCW 844160, and the street address if available. It, it, the statute goes on to say, and may include any other identification of the construction site by the, the prime contractor or general contractor, but um, Getting the legal description or the tax parcel number is, is critical, um, and I think it, it, it kind of gives you both options on, on doing that, but belt and suspenders. If you've got the information, if you've got the legal description, the tax parcel number, street address, put it all in there. Make sure your notice has got everything in it that you need uh, so that you are, are protected as a, as a contractor. Uh, you also need the property owner's name, address, and phone number. You're going to need general contractor, prime contractor's business name, address, phone number, current state contractor registration number, and identification. Uh, so getting both the property owner's information, name, address, phone number, and the prime contractor's business information, again, uh, name, uh, name, address, phone number, and registration number and identification. And then one more step either the name, address, and phone number of the office of the lender administering any interim construction financing. So if there's any interim construction financing at issue, you'll, you'll want to give the contact information for the lender's office or the name and address of the firm that has issued any payment bond uh, on behalf of the prime contractor and general contract for the, for the protection of the owner. If the bond is for an amount not less than 50% of the amount of the construction project. So if the bond is for uh, not less than 50%, you're going to want to have that information in there. Uh, there's also a separate statute with, with um, posting requirements that, that is uh, outside of the statute uh, that's required for certain types of projects um, that I'm not going to get into here, but that's RCW 19.27.095. Uh, and to the extent you comply with that statute, that is considered uh, compliant for purposes of this statute. And again, the, the failure here uh, is a civil penalty of not more than $5,000 payable to the county where the project is located. So it's a little bit different in that some of the other uh, notices that you have to require, if you don't, if you don't, uh, I'm sorry, if you have to provide, if you're required to provide some of those other uh, uh, notices, if you don't provide them, you can't enforce your lien rights at all. Uh, this one, you're looking at a, at a monetary penalty, which, you know, by up to five thousand dollars, you don't want to pay that if you don't have to. If you just follow, you know, the rules that, that need to be followed uh, under this uh, statute, and it, it's it's not a difficult thing to do, but it's definitely an important thing to be aware of and just be cognizant of. So, making sure you know your steps going in can save you a lot of heat going down the road. So let's go to something that's equally important, or perhaps arguably more important, or just as important, uh, is the contents of the lien. 
So your lien needs to have uh, certain information in it in order for it to be uh, effective. And you know, a lot of attorneys will have kind of their 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 nuts and bolts on all these things set up when they prepare these liens. I know uh, you just need to make sure it's all in there. So the name, phone number, and address of the claimant, the first and last date upon which labor, professional services, materials, or equipment was furnished, or employee benefit contributions were due. And boy, knowing the first date and last date on which you provided your labor or services or materials or equipment is critical. Keeping track of that is very important because that can seriously affect your lien rights. It affects how long uh, your, your timelines for when you need to record your lien, which I'm going to get into a little bit later. Um, but, but keeping track of that uh, is, is something that will save you a lot of heartburn down the road. I, I know that it, it's one of the things that I've I've certainly had contractors tell me, boy, I wish I paid better attention to the exact date we started. Uh, and just making sure that you are aware of that at the beginning and you've got it nailed down and you, you've got it logged in. So there's no question of when you started and stops providing these services. It's going to save you a lot of trouble uh, and it's going to make things easier. And when you go to actually record your lien, you'll know you're in the right timeline and you've made it in the, in the time period required and, and you don't have questions about that. It also becomes from a litigation standpoint, it's just easier to enforce your lien rights. Certainly easier for me if I know when you've started and stopped the work and neither of us have any questions or raised eyebrows about it. So uh, getting that in is important. The name of the person indebted to the claimant, claimant so the debtor, and the street address, legal description, or other description reasonably calculated to identify for a person familiar with the area, the location of the real property charge of the lien. So, uh, you know, something that will tell people where this property is. Typically, in most circumstances, we're talking about a street address uh, and a legal description. Best practice, if, if I have it, I will put in the tax parcel number, the street address, and the legal description. So there's just no question about where this place is. Uh, it, it just makes things easier and, um, you know, no question about where it's going to be. People generally identify where a property is by those three uh, indicators if you've got all three of them. Um, the name of the owner or reputed owner of the property, if known. And if it's not known, that fact shall be stated. Um, most circumstances, you know who the property owner is, um, but you got to get that information in there. And if you don't know, and if there's no way to know for some reason, then you'll have to state that fact. And then, of course, the principal amount for which the lien is claimed. So obviously, what is your lien amount? How much is owed to you pursuant to this project? Uh, so, you, you know, you've got a series of different things you need to get into your lien. Get it all in. Make sure it's thorough and make sure you, you've crossed off, you know, I should say crossed off, checked all the boxes on your checklist. Checklists are great for this sort of thing, but just make sure you've got everything in there uh, so that your lien is enforceable and you're not going to run into any problems down the road. Um, so beyond that, we're going to get into one of the most important parts of this whole thing. Uh, do not be late. Let me repeat that. Do not be late. Uh, timing is everything with this statute. Uh, there's timing for when you record your lien, there's timing for when you file a lawsuit to foreclose on the lien, and there's even timing for when you need to get your judgment once you've filed your lawsuit. And messing this up can be a huge problem. So the first one is recording your lien. And it's not later than 90 days after the person has ceased to furnish labor, professional services, material, or equipment, or the last day on which employment I'm sorry, employee benefit contributions were due. So when we were talking, when I was talking earlier about the uh, knowing the, the ending date of the work that you've, done, of you, that you've done, this is what I was talking about. This is why it's so important to keep track of the last date you worked on because you have to record your lien within 90 days of that date. So if you don't know the date, you're in big trouble. And, and if you know the date and you wait 100 days or 93 days, you're in trouble. So you really have to, to hit those deadlines and know when those deadlines are. And, and I can tell you, I've, I've seen a lot of times where uh, uh, contractors, subcontractors aren't paying attention to it. And then they figure out on day 88 or 89, shoot, I need to record this right away. And they scramble to, to do it themselves or get you know an attorney to, to get it together and get it for them and, and, and make it a final 
fire drill. And it doesn't have to be that way if you're on top of what your timelines are. So definitely pay close attention to uh, your ending date with the work that you've done. Um, and beware, there has been a uh, recent case law that's come out that, talk, that talks about performing warranty work may not extend this timeline. So if, if it's work to essentially repair work that you did, that's not going to give you more time. And, and that's a kind of a complex area that's not suitable for a webinar that, that we're already, you know, 20 minutes in, but uh, important to, to consider and perhaps talk with counsel is, you know, if you've conducted work and you've finished it and then you're asked to go back out to correct something or correct something that the general says that you did wrong and then it turns out that the general did something wrong or any host of different circumstances, you may be in a, in a difficult position in terms of dealing with that. So make sure that 90 days, make sure you know when your, your work was finished before you were called out to deal with any kind of warranty or additional repair for work that was already considered complete. Uh, filing your lawsuit within eight calendar months of recording your lien. Again, another thing to pay attention to. Once you've recorded your lien, put that deadline in eight calendar months. Make sure that if you're going to file a lawsuit to foreclose your lien, if you're going to enforce your lien rights in court, you file that suit on time. Uh, because if you don't, you're not going to be able to enforce the lien against the property. Uh, and then obtaining your judgment within two years of filing suit or you risk dismissal by the court. Now, this is kind of interesting because when you're in litigation, some counties, for example, uh, Snohomish County doesn't have a case schedule. And so what will happen is you file a lawsuit and if parties just don't do anything for a year, the court will often you know, say, we're going to dismiss your lawsuit if you don't do anything. And then people will scramble and do something so their lawsuit isn't dismissed. But if it is dismissed the first time, it's without prejudice which means you can refile. Other counties like King County have a case schedule and they're basically, you have to follow the case schedule and, and the courts are a bit more active in monitoring what's going on. With this statute, what's interesting is that if you don't prosecute the case to judgment within two years of filing, the court can dismiss the action and it's essentially dismissed with prejudice. You can't refile your, your lien rights, your right to, to foreclose or act on the lien in court is gone. So uh, that is a, uh, an important distinction and something to certainly be aware of. Um, I'm going to talk about lien priority. This is kind of interesting. The, the contractor liens work in a little bit different way because uh, oftentimes when it comes to uh, liens or, or mortgages or deeds of trust, et cetera, that record against the property, it's kind of a first in time, first in right. If you record first, you're, you have priority. Here, it's liens shall have priority over any lien, mortgage, deed of trust, or other encumbrance which attached to the land after or was unrecorded at the time of the commencement of labor or professional services or first delivery of materials or equipment by the lien claimant. So this goes back to what I was talking about earlier about knowing when you started to do the work. Because uh, if, if a lien, another lien, a competing lien or mortgage, let's say, or a deed of trust is recorded after you started the work, so not after you recorded the lien, but after you started the work, you, you could have priority over that uh, deed of trust because you started the work before they recorded it. Uh, so knowing when you started the work is equally important to knowing when you finished uh, in order to take full advantage of the protections of the statute because this is a, a, protect, a protection in the statute for contractors that isn't necessarily available for uh, people who are recording encumbrances on properties under other statutes or in other circumstances. So you definitely want to know when you started. You definitely want to know when you ended. Uh, and then there is a, a rank ranking system for different construction liens recorded against the same property. Uh, there's, there's orders of priority and courts will classify them. Uh, you've got liens for performance of labor, um, liens for contributions owed for an employee benefit plan. Um, you've got liens for furnishing materials, supplies, or equipment, and then liens for subcontractors, including but not limited to their laborers and materials, and then liens for the general contractors or for professional services. So different classes of liens uh, to, to be considered. Um, so there's a lot going on in the statute. There's a lot to remember. You know, Certainly call or email with questions, but I, I think what some of the major takeaways here are to Get your notices out if they apply to you and get them on time. Make sure you know when you started and ended your work. Make sure that if you're going to record a lien, you record a lien in the time frame that you need to. You know, 
know, again, within 90 days of when you finish uh, the work and, you know, file your suit on time, eight months, calendar months from when you record your lien and, and get your judgment within two years of filing suit. Um, remembering all that, remember when you started your work so you know about your priority over uh, mortgages or deeds of trust that may be recorded after you started your work uh, that weren't there when you started. Keeping these things in mind will save you a lot of hard burn. Um, and the last thing I will talk about is, um, sorry, uh, frivolous liens, just briefly, because it's, it's interesting, but um, uh, frivolous liens are, are an issue that come up from time to time. Uh, and, and in the statute, basically, uh, a number of different classes of, of parties can challenge a lien believed to be frivolous or clearly excessive um, by filing a motion with the superior court of the county where the property is located. And this can be done regardless of whether the party that recorded the lien has actually filed their own lawsuit. Uh, so the property owner can file this motion, another contractor, a lender, et cetera. Uh, and they filed, they can essentially start their own lawsuit by filing this motion. Uh, and they have to get an order and the order needs to state, you know, the time and place of when this hearing on the motion is going to take place. And if the lien claimant doesn't show up to the hearing after they've been properly notified, the lien will be released with prejudice. And the lien claimant will have to pay attorney's fees and costs to the disputing parties. So very important uh, to, to if you get a frivolous uh, a motion saying that you know your lien is frivolous or clearly excessive to respond accordingly otherwise you may be adversely affected by simply ignoring it uh, and the superior court has a statutory authority to give attorneys fees or award attorneys fees and costs to the prevailing party at this hearing hearing so uh, it, this doesn't come up necessarily as often as some of the other issues, but I have seen it come up from time to time, especially the, the clearly excessive issues can come up uh, in circumstances where someone has recorded a lien against multiple properties for, uh, that are owned by a single owner for, for construction on all these properties. And it just starts to get complicated. The math gets complicated. And so I've seen parties dispute you know, how much work was done and what it cost and how to apportion that between the properties. So it does come up from time to time. Um, so I've gone a little bit over the, the typical uh, the 20 or so minutes that, that we spend on this. So if you do have questions, like I said, call me or email me. My contact information is here. Uh, Bobak S at BeresfordLaw.com is my email and you can call our general phone number. I hope that you found this informative today. Um, Again, there's a lot to digest when it comes to this statute. There's a lot of intricacies and you know, hiring counsel could be helpful to dealing with this. But even without counsel on the front end of it, always make sure that you're aware of when you're doing your work and what you're doing, getting your notices out and all that. And you'll be much happier if you follow the provisions of the statute than you will be if you do not. So certainly keep it in mind. I uh, hope you found this informative. And I think I'm going to be wrapping it up for today. And I said, please contact us with any questions or concerns. We're always happy to help you. Thank you very much.